as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Lord Jesus, come quickly. This morning, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. I invite you to turn there with me. Growing up, the Lord's Supper always confused me when I was a little child. Never quite understood exactly what they were doing. But there are at least three things that I did understand about the Lord's Supper as I watched. First, I understood as a little boy, there was absolutely no talking aloud during the Lord's Supper. My mother made sure I understood that with a very firm hand of discipline whenever I would start to talk. Second, I learned that the Lord's Supper was the only time that food and drink was allowed in the sanctuary. But I wasn't allowed to partake because I wasn't a baptized believer and I thought that I was getting ripped off that way. I wanted to drink the grape juice. And then third and finally, I learned through looking around at everybody that the people who took the Lord's Supper seriously always look sad, that it had to be like a sad face if it was a serious face when it came to the Lord's Supper. And when you are confessing your sins and you're considering the price that's paid for your sins, sorrow and grief is a good and appropriate response. To consider what Jesus endured on our behalf should not be done lightly. And while there is grief over sin, my friends, I, I want you to know there is also joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not come simply so we could have a remembrance that would cause us sorrow. We are sorrowful over our sins, but we rejoice in what he has done. And it is this joy of God's salvation that I want to talk about this morning in the book of Isaiah as we prepare our hearts to hear from God's word, I ask you to bow with me for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, Emmanuel, you came to die in our place. And you, the Lamb who was slain, are worthy of honor glory, dominion, praise. You are worthy of our adoration. You are worthy of our faith. There is none who compares to you, Lord God Most High. And so we come seeking your precious words, seeking your precious presence, asking that you would speak to us now, that you would convict us, and that you would give us faith, repentance, and the joy of your salvation. May your word produce abundant fruit in our hearts. May it not return void. Please, Lord God, speak the words of life. Our souls are weary and desperate, and we need, we need to hear from you. So please, Lord God, speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Isaiah chapter 9, uh, we've been studying through the book of Isaiah and we last week were talking about a very difficult subject matter, the coming judgment of the Assyrians upon Israel, the devastation that would happen to Judah, and the destruction that happens when we fear men instead of fearing God. But when we fear God... We wait upon him expectantly for his salvation to come. And we ended chapter 8 by Isaiah talking about these people who had rejected the word of God. And because they rejected the word of God, they would be plunged into darkness. They would trade light for darkness because they traded a lie for, or they traded the truth for a lie. And in verse 22 we read, Then they will look to the earth and behold distress in darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be driven away into darkness. We know from history that in 722, the Assyrian Empire stormed into the northern nation of Israel and destroyed them completely and took the people of Israel 
out of the land and dispersed them among the nations and brought other people and settled them in the land. We know that Judah continued in their sin and immorality until 586 B.C. when the Babylonian Empire came and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and removed them out of their land and settled other people in their land. We know that that northern nation became increasingly more and more pagan and Gentile until when Jesus' time came, they had nothing but darkness. They were lost in the darkness because of their sins. This is what happened. This is what God said would happen. And we know that God's word cannot be broken. But God doesn't leave us with 822. Chapter 9, verse 1, I invite you to read along with me. He says, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. As with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, these two tribes took up the northern part of the northern kingdom of Israel. The land would become known as Galilee, a place in which Gentiles dwelt. And in this darkness and in this gloom, Isaiah says a day is coming when all of that is going to end. The anguish is going to be undone. While God may have treated you that way in the past, a day is coming that he's going to reverse it and he's going to make it glorious. And in that day, you who walk in the darkness will see a great light. There is hope on the horizon, he says. There is hope who is... You who are in darkness, that this light is coming. And when we get to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew looks at this passage and he looks at Jesus who's going throughout Galilee healing the sick and, and casting out the demons and feeding those who have nothing. And he looks at that and he says, Behold, those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The Son of God has come. And he has brought the hope that they have been waiting for, the gladness that comes. He says, you shall increase their gladness. And while they're going to see the reason why with the removal of oppression, I want you to note the very middle section of verse 3. It says, they will be glad in your presence. It's not just that God is going to reverse things and bring glory instead of gloom, but God himself is going to come to the people of Israel. They will behold him. And in his presence, they will be glad. They will rejoice. And it's not just because it's a fun, festive time, but it's because of what he comes to do. It says in verse 4, For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, as at the battle of Midian, referencing Gideon and the salvation that God brought in that time period. He says, for every boot of the booted warrior in battle, tumult, and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. I don't know if it's just because I'm a guy, but verse 5 is really cool. <laughs> the boot of the booted warrior in battle, tumult, and cloak rolled in blood it will be simply fuel for the fire. He says, this, this, this day is coming that the light is going to pierce through the darkness, and he's going to bring such hope and such glory because he's going to break the rod of oppression that is upon you. The darkness that is overwhelming you. He is not coming simply to make you glad in his presence. He is coming to remove what has been oppressing you. Now Israel looked at this and they said it's going to be a time of national salvation. A, a removal of the oppressive Romans Jesus came to remove an even greater threat, an even stronger oppressor. He came to remove the oppression of sin and of death itself. It's broken. It has no power over us. Oh, death, where is your sting? It's gone. 
Because the light has come. He has removed the hostility. So you can take these elements of warfare, the, the boot and the cloak rolled in blood, this idea of people fighting, and you can throw it all into the fire because it's not needed anymore. Because peace has been brought with the coming of Christ. We rejoice in the coming of Christ. I want you to note something here. Verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness, those who live in a dark land. What Isaiah is talking about is he's not talking about people who are pursuing God. He's not talking about people who are morally upright and therefore deserving of what God is going to do. He's talking about people who live in darkness, not just around them, but in them. He's talking about people who are oppressed by sin, who we would say are living in sin. These people are not pursuing God, but God pursues them. That's what happened with Jesus. They weren't pursuing God, but God came down. He reached down, light pierced the darkness to pursue those who were his enemies. The birth of Jesus Christ is the love of God on display. How many of us want to be pursued, want to be chased after, want to be cared for so much? Somebody would go to the ends of the earth to take care of you. God did this in Jesus. He pursued you with all that he is and all that he has to grant us salvation so that we could be his. We should rejoice. We should be a people of great joy. How much do we really stop to rejoice in the coming of Christ? Christmas season, you know, you have all the atmosphere and the environment and the, the gifts and the parties and the food and all of those things. And we rejoice in those things. I mean, we rejoice in such simple things. We even will rejoice in the miraculous things if the Cowboys actually win. It will be a joyful season this year. But how much joy, just the simple fact that Jesus came down for us. How much joy does that give us? I, I don't know that the problem is necessarily that we think too little of God, although that certainly is a problem. I think the problem is that we think too highly of ourselves. Let me tell you what I mean by that. We look at God and we say, God, thank you for helping me. You're a great helper. As if somehow we were doing pretty well on our own and we just needed a little help to get across the finish line. We think highly of ourselves. God, I'm a pretty good person, so of course you're going to want me in your kingdom. But Isaiah looks at us and he says, no. In fact, later he's going to be talking about our works and how they're filthy rags before the holy God. We live in darkness and we enjoy darkness. We don't deserve God's grace. We think so highly of ourselves as to actually think God helps us to be saved. God doesn't help us. God takes us and makes us his own. He pierces down through the darkness of our very souls to cleanse us of the sins that you and I desperately cling to. This is who God is. This is his love and the greatness of his actions with Jesus Christ on the cross. We didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. We won't deserve it. And yet he rescued us. Let us not rejoice as a people who have been given a great gift. Let us rejoice as an enslaved, oppressed people who through no work of our own have been set free by the coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible commands us to rejoice. And that joy comes when, first of all, we see how little we deserved it. But secondly, when we're willing to surrender to the lordship of this Christ child. Verse 6, read with me. He is going to explain now how this freedom is going to come, how the salvation is going to come. Uh, the the yoke's going to be broken, the 
the instruments of war are going to be thrown into the fire. Verse 6, for a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government, literally the dominion, will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The most amazing thing takes place as we've been reading through these last chapters. We've seen the significance of children, particularly Isaiah's children. The promise of Emmanuel in chapter 7, verse 14. We see uh, Isaiah's sons in chapter 8. And we, we see that, that these children stand as signs of God's presence, of God's uh, power, of God's providence. We see these as signs of what God is doing. But here in chapter 9, we don't have a child who stands as a sign. The Emmanuel of 714 is a sign that God is with you. But here in chapter 9, as he talks about the salvation that's going to come, this light that's going to come, glory instead of gloom, uh, the the freedom from oppression, he says it's going to happen because a child is going to be given to us. Not as a sign as these other ones, Isaiah says, but a child whose name is God. The Emmanuel of 714 is a sign of God's presence, but he says here in chapter 9, this child will be literally God with us. He says the government's going to rest on his shoulders, and I want to stress this point because this child would break under the weight of dominion and rule and authority of all of creation if he is merely a child. But he's not merely a child. So he not only says dominion is going to rest on his shoulders so that he can lift the rod of oppression off of your shoulders, but he says that can happen and the child can endure that and the child can hold that up because of his names. All four of these names are used through the book of Isaiah to refer only to God, wonderful counselor, mighty God, of course, eternal father, prince of peace. As we read earlier, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. This is what Jesus said. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is nothing less than God himself. This is why he's able to come and pierce the darkness. This is why he's able to come and break the yoke. This is why he's able to bring a lasting peace because he is God. But he didn't just come to be God on earth. He came to accomplish a purpose. So Isaiah says there's going to be no end to the increase of his government or a peace. That Jesus is going to establish his kingdom and uphold his kingdom with justice and righteousness. As we've been going through the book of Isaiah, we've seen these two words together several times. Justice and righteousness. And it's always been very negative. Because Israel is supposed to uphold their kingdom in justice and righteousness. And what does Israel do? They fail. Remember the parable of the vineyard in chapter 5. I planted you and I took care of you because I expected you to produce justice and righteousness. And what did you do? You produced bloodshed, violence, sin. Israel fails. And the kingdom is wiped out. By Assyria, Judah fails. And the kingdom is wiped out by the Babylonians. Jesus comes and doesn't fail. Therefore, his kingdom lasts forever. He has dominion and can grant everlasting peace because he does it the right way. With justice, with righteousness. And he can do that Because he's God. It says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. It's not our zeal, church, that brings about the kingdom of God on earth. It's not our evangelistic excitement that brings about the salvation of the nations. It is the zeal and the passion of God that brings about his will and his plan 
on earth. But what I want you to note here is this idea of dominion. We like the idea of salvation. We like the idea of forgiveness. We like the idea of peace. But all of these ideas are wrapped up in his dominion. In his lordship. His authority. A few years before the end of World War II, as the war was really taking steam and the Germans began to see just how bad Hitler really was, you had a group of Germans that were anti-Nazi uh, coalition, you could say. They secretly reached out to the Allies and they said to the Allies, look, we don't like what Hitler's doing. We'll overthrow him. We've got the resources to build. We'll overthrow him. But you have to give us some assurances that when it happens, we won't be held responsible for all the bad things that have already been done. In other words, we want guarantees that you're not going to come after us when we take Hitler out. This is what they said to the Allies. The Allies sent back to them and said, no, total surrender or nothing. And this group that r recognized, saw the evil of Hitler, had the power to stop Hitler, wouldn't do it. For three more years, the war went on. I don't know how many lives were lost. Because they would not totally surrender themselves to the Allies. They said, nope, not going to do it. You've got you to gotta work with us. Come on, bargain, compromise. This is the way it works in the world. It doesn't work that way with God. We cannot bargain with God. We cannot come to God and say, look, I'll give you my faith and I'll be yours, but you've got you know, you to leave these sins alone because I really like them and I don't want to be without them. We can't come to God and say, look, I'll be yours, but there are just a few things, ground rules, I'm not going to do A, B, and C. That's not surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And Jesus did not come to be bargained with. He came to rescue his people and to place them under his sovereign divine rule. He says, if you're going to come to me as Savior, you have to come to me as Lord. Surrendering to my authority over you. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And we cannot bargain with him we rob ourselves of so much peace and so much joy and so much gladness and so much victory because we refuse to surrender to the lordship of jesus christ we say god i will go this far but no farther even though god is saying i want you to go all the way we say god i'll do these things but not these things even though this is what god is calling us to do I'll give up these sins, but not these sins, even though God calls us to be holy. And because of that, believers, this is true for us as much as for the unbeliever. We find ourselves a church that is oppressed by sin. A church that is overwhelmed by the darkness of this world that has creeped in so thoroughly that we don't even recognize it at times. Because we have made ourselves Lord, and Jesus is only our Savior. But the Christ child did not come simply to save. He came to rule as God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Listen, peace only comes through His rule. Therefore, we must surrender our claim to authority over our lives. If we're to experience the peace that he offers. When we surrender to Jesus as our Lord. We can rejoice in Jesus as our Savior. But when we refuse the one. We're robbed of the other. Pray with me. Lord Jesus. I confess my own struggles of submission and surrender. Truly, Lord, you have sought a weak people. And so we pray for your grace that we might give our hearts to you fully.
today. We know that faith is a gift from above. For all good things come down from the Father of lights. So Lord, our God, I pray that you would grant us this gift this morning. That we'd be able to surrender our lives totally to you. That it would be your will and not ours. That we might experience the joy of your salvation. That we might, of all people on this earth, rejoice. Lord God, please work in our hearts, in this place, in this time. May your word produce the fruit that you desire it to produce. That we might be made more like Jesus as we respond. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning, uh, we're going to have our song of invitation. I'm going to be down here at the front to pray. We'll have a deacon in the back to pray with you if you need some more time to talk. For somebody here, it might be that you have been running from God your whole life. I don't know why you're here, but God has brought you here so that you could hear of his love for you and how he has pursued you so passionately that you would be his. And there's nothing you can do to be forgiven of your sins, to have peace with God, to have life everlasting. Nothing you can do to go to heaven when you die. But believe in Jesus who's already done it all for you. And it is a surrender. Yes, it means you give up your life for Jesus. But in return you get life everlasting. And if that's you, then this morning I'm inviting you, even if it's just the first time for you, to come and surrender your heart and your life to Jesus as Lord that you might know Him as Savior. Christian, you say, I've done that, I'm good. We all have areas of our lives that we try to withhold from God. We all have those things that we really just don't want God to have his say on. And I don't know what that is for you because I'm not God. But he does. And if he's convicting you of that this morning, make this Christmas a good Christmas. Surrender to our Lord Jesus. Whatever that might be, whatever the sacrifice might be, whatever the cost might be, it doesn't matter because it will fade away as you experience the joy of His grace and of His salvation and of His love. But you cannot have those things if you're not willing to give up the others. God is not mocked. He is light, not darkness. And if we want to enjoy His light, we must be willing to leave the darkness. So Christian... If that's you, surrender it. Surrender that you might be filled with joy this Christmas season. A joy that is beyond comprehension. Surrender and rejoice in Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Please stand with me and let's sing our song of